recorded every second of it in the Scottish Government's uh, internet web uh, team over there, uh, recording every iota. And we'll make that available, of course, to Craigroyston High School for a small bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, times are tough. <laughs> but I think it's uh, wonderful what we've all experienced uh, this evening. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Lord Provost Office, uh, to Fergus Ewing for inviting me to speak at the event, to uh, Councillor Marlon McClam, who set out so clearly why this is a, an important event for Edinburgh. I particularly welcome Councillor Deirdre Brock's announcement of the library service will be making Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, how they'll be marking that. Uh, this, however, uh, is a, an important event not just for our capital city of Edinburgh, uh, but for our whole nation of Scotland. So I'd like to thank Victor Spence of the Edinburgh Interfaith Association, together with Carly Whiteborn from the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, Ros Sandu from the Holocaust Educational Trust, and all of her colleagues who have contributed to this event, particularly to Carly and Ros for travelling up from London this evening. But above all, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, to thank the pupils of Craig Royston Community High School. Uh, this has been an extraordinary evening. My congratulations go to them the school's head teacher, Margaret Russell, and all of her colleagues. Uh, and I'd like to recognise and uh, was particularly moved by the active participation of pupils from this school, but also from All Saints Roman Catholic Secondary School in Glasgow. Ladies and gentlemen, why do we uh, remember the, the Holocaust? The question is best answered in the words of the late Ernest Levy, which were read out earlier by Mike Wade. We are trying to tell the world so this cannot happen again. And we have learned a lot, though many have still not learned from the past. We are trying to tell the world so this cannot happen again, and we have learned a lot, although many have still not learned from the past. The Mike told us that Ernest Levy loved the great Hungarian football team in the 1950s. If I remember correctly, they were called in Glasgow the Magical Magyars. I suppose when we think about it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ernest Levy was a magical Maggie Ed. In my view, uh, in our view, we need to keep telling the world about the Holocaust until the world learns the lesson. Six million Jewish people died at the hands of the Nazis. We remember them today, and indeed the millions of Gentiles who died with them. We also remember the genocides in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in Cambodia, in Darfur. But the origin, scale, and systematic nature of the Jewish Holocaust deserves the particular recognition we give it. The stigmatization of the Jewish people did not come from a historical void. It didn't begin with the rise of Adolf Hitler. For many centuries in Europe, Jewish people were in the minds of primitive Europe, Christ killers who should be put to death by fire and sword. They were marginalized, persecuted, they were called names. Martin Luther, one of the, the great figures of European history, a man who is very well treated by history, of course, was venomous in his attacks on the Jews. Martin Luther used language like, quote, poisonous bitter worms to describe Jews. It is that language and attitude that led hundreds of years later to the Nazi factories of death. Language is hugely important. We heard uh, a few minutes ago how the state radio in Rwanda used the word cockroaches to describe the ethnic Tutsis in the early 1990s. Within days, millions of Tutsis lay dead in the street, hacked to pieces by their neighbors. So let's be mindful of language. Poisonous worms, cockroaches, Jew boy, packy, poop, spaz. They say sticks and stones can break your bones, but names can never harm you. But names, of course, lead to sticks and stones, and they do break bones, just as the burning of books leads to the burning of Jews. It was wonderful to hear the testimony of Rabbi Sutendorf. He describes the child, how he escaped the Holocaust, sheltered by a German couple. The work he does now with young people encouraging mutual respect is admirable. The rabbi is closely involved in initiatives that promote education and social justice. He's involved with groups that encourage dialogue, for example, between Islam and the West. All this is so important in preventing conflict and persecution because the roots of intolerance, of inequality and ignorance that feed hatred must be tackled. Words, again, are important, 
Because just as hate language leads to hate crime, so dialogue leads to understanding. I know that the rabbi's father was closely involved in re-establishing these Jewish communities in his native Poland, which was so nearly destroyed totally in the Second World War. And we are immensely proud of our own long-standing Jewish communities here in Scotland. They have always been and always will remain part of this country's rich tapestry, part of the tartan that makes up Scotland. Indeed, the, the man who for many years was the foremost authority in Scottish literature and culture, the late Professor David Dykes of Edinburgh, was the son of a Lithuanian-born rabbi. Dykes wrote of his dual sense of identity in an Edinburgh childhood. He said that the sound of the bagpipes would stir him in a Scottish mood just as the plaintive chants of the synagogue would evoke his sense of Jewish identity. Like his father had believed there was a strong mutual respect between Jews and Scots Presbyterians, both of whom revered the Old Testament. He also noted that Scotland was one of the few countries in medieval Europe which never had a state law persecuting Jewish people. It was also from Dikes that I first learned that the Declaration of Abroth notes that God makes no distinction between Jew and Greek, Scotsman or Englishman. Quite advanced thinking for 1320. <laughs> so it's important today that we make no distinction with people on the grounds of their religion or culture. When the uh, rabbi told us of the importance of uh, compassion, I was thinking that uh, the word compassion, of course, is emblazoned on the mace of the Scots Parliament, along with the words integrity and justice. Does that always mean that the Scots Parliament acts in a compassionate way or a just way or always follows the path of integrity? No, it doesn't. But that doesn't make it unimportant to aspire to these qualities. Indeed, it makes it all the more important to aspire to these qualities. Does the fact that uh, Scotland through history has never had any anti-Semitic legislation mean that there are no acts of discrimination in Scotland today? No, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. But it means that we should aspire to see our self-image as a nation, as a nation which doesn't tolerate bigotry or discrimination. So that's why I'm so uh, glad that events for Holocaust Memorial Day take place across the nations. Activities in Scotland have been increasing since the first national event was held here in Edinburgh back in 2003. Last year, 35 events, I'm told, were held from the Orkney Islands to South Ayrshire, from Inverness to St Andrews. This year, 61 events have been confirmed, and more are being organised. And with the support of people like yourselves, the impact of Holocaust Memorial Day can only continue to grow. Now, one of the themes of our remembrance is the untold stories approach. It's easy to talk about numbers, murdered and persecuted during the Holocaust and these subsequent genocides. It's less easy to appreciate what these numbers mean. They were individuals, mothers, fathers, children, a friend, a colleague, a neighbour. People who loved and cared and who were loved and cared about to return. There are millions, countless millions of stories we'll never know. But we can still honour the memory of those affected by genocide by playing a part in these unstold stories. We can listen and learn, and we can tell others the stories we hear. The stories we were told this evening of what happens to gypsy travelers in Rwanda, were moving to hear and necessary to hear, they're not always easy to hear. But regardless of that, we mustn't shy away from these stories, we must learn from the past and the present so that things can be changed for the better. And just as the, the millions of victims are not a statistic, but individuals, so too are the hundreds of thousands of perpetrators. You see, the perpetrators were also fathers and brothers, mothers, sisters. And one of the many lessons we learn from confronting the horrors of Holocaust is understanding that mobs and movements were made up of individuals. And we learn that each and every one of us as individuals has a choice. It's a choice we exercise every single day in what we choose to be part of and how we choose to behave. So let us leave here this evening resolved certainly to honour the memories of those who were victims of the Holocaust, do what we can.
can to relieve suffering internationally, to play a full part in tackling discrimination in our own country, in our own communities. In the book of Revelation, uh, St. John the Divine witnessed the emergence of a new heaven and a new earth. In my religion, the accent is to not to wait to the emergence of the new heaven, but the task is for all of us to create the new earth.